Telecast, the TV industry news review. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to this week's Telecast. It's a back to production special this week, and my guest is Danny Fenton, CEO of leading UK indie Zigzag Productions. John McVeigh, OBE, Chief Executive of PACT, takes us through the landmark new Emergency COVID Insurance Fund which could open the floodgates to a backlog of UK TV and film production worth an estimated £1 billion. And this week, K7 Media's Gertz Lesis looks at production restarting on a global level. It's all coming up on this week's Telecast. So I'm delighted to welcome back onto Telecast John McVeigh, Chief Executive of PACT, the UK Film and TV Producers Alliance. John, welcome back. You're the first person on telecast to come back for a second time. Thank you for that. How are you doing? Oh, well, I'm very good. I'm honoured to be invited back. Thank you very much. You promised us when you first came on, it was back in May, and you told us you were involved in discussions with the UK government about unlocking, unblocking this this production logjam that we saw. Late last week, PACT and a number of partners announced the film and TV production restart scheme. So congratulations on getting that over line. Can you tell us a bit more about that? We'd been flagging up to government following the introduction of social distancing, which basically closed down all production, that while we would probably be able to work out safe working protocols, uh, which is what we did do as an industry across all parts of the industry, film, TV, uh, etc., we've managed to do that. One of our biggest concerns was we knew we wouldn't get production insurance. And without production insurance, you have to be a very brave or have very deep pockets in order to think about getting productions up and running. And clearly for your crew, your cast, facilities, everyone wants to know that you're insured so that you can pay people and do things properly if you were to going to be subject to some COVID-related event, whether that was a suspension of your production, a local lockdown, or God forbid, another national lockdown. We had worked a pace, uh, along with uh, all our colleagues and all the major broadcasters, to bring this to the attention of government. Government said, OK, we get it. They set up a very high-level uh, working group, which involved Frontier Economics, PwC, officials from the Treasury, the Bank of England, DCMS, uh, advisors to both Rishi Sunak and Number 10. And we then spent many, many weeks working through what would a solution look like, how big would it have to be. We collected an awful lot of data from across the industry to show government how much was sitting on the books that could actually get back into production. And of course, the fundamental of that was if we can get back into production, we can take freelancers off furlough, which uh, obviously puts a bit of a glint in the eye for Mr. Sunak, that um, we can get people back to work, paying taxes, having meaningful employment. And of course, for all of us in the creative industries, rather than sitting around not working, um, we'd much rather be back doing what we love doing, which is making films and TV programmes. So it was a a long task. Uh, We had a lot of information to get. We had to do a lot of work with officials in government. And then last Wednesday, they announced the setting up of a government fund. This is, you know, absolutely crucial to give everybody the confidence they need. Can you talk us through a bit more about what the scheme entails practically? It's a fund where there'll be sort of effectively two elements to your production insurance. One will be your normal insurable production insurance, which you need to take out from a commercial insurance broker and from commercial insurance companies. But of course, none of those companies are offering any form of COVID cover. That's obviously the biggest problem, uh, which which you should be concerned about. In light of that, it's pretty clear there's a market failure that those commercial insurers are not willing to take on the risk of COVID. And that was the case we made to government. So you would basically be paying a premium for normal production insurance. You will then pay a to-be-announced premium for government COVID cover. And bear in mind that that's backdated, so you could start filming today And the scheme opened for business last Wednesday. So if you started filming today, you would then, if you had losses that you had to claim from the government, you'd pay a premium. There'll be some deductibles for those losses. And then government would pay you an agreed amount of money to help cover you for your costs of suspension or abandonment for cast and crew and in the UK civil authority. So... 
basically that would give you the confidence that you can basically set up a production if god forbid something were to happen with key people and you have to suspend you would be able to cover those losses uh, or if you had to abandon you'd be able to cover those losses it also gives confidence to banks or financiers that you have the means to suspend and restart because government will cover the covid costs for that in our business production insurance is really all about getting to the finished program it's not basically saying here's some money to compensate you for losses and you go oh well i won't bother actually most of the productions that locked down in march the vast majority of them over 99% of them were for suspension claims not abandonment or cancellation claims clearly everyone recognizes that the value is in the finished production so everyone wants that to happen but of course in our industry insurance is a way of giving comfort to financiers and bank lenders that you can have the means to then deliver the product get paid for it and pay back the money that you may have borrowed or been invested with for the production itself so it's not just about compensating for the actual losses you may have it's also about giving confidence back to the market that as a sector we can confidently get back to work if god forbid something were to happen then we can look at continue that production at a later date completing it and realizing the value in that production for everyone concerned and is this a open ended agreement the um, fund currently will end june 2021 in order to access the fund now, you have to go into principal photography before the end of this calendar year. But government is very mindful that they may have to extend the scheme over next year as well. But of course, we don't know yet when commercial insurers may come back to the market. So government has to structure some dates in public interventions in the market. So basically, you have to be into principal photography before the end of this calendar year, and you will be covered for all production activity through to the end of June next year but that may be extended as well clearly if the commercial insurers are not offering us a market solution to this then government will probably have to continue to offer this facility now bear in mind this is not cash that they are making available it's not like the cultural recovery fund which is 1.5 billion going out the treasury's doors this is an allocation in the treasury for potential claims well of course we don't know how big those claims would be because none of us know how the pandemic is going to play out in which place, on what production. You know, you can imagine if there were very few claims by next June and there was still the vast bulk of the £500 million sitting on the books at the Treasury, it wouldn't be such a hard argument to say, let's just roll that forward until there's a market solution. So while there is a structure to it, that structure is something the government has committed that with us, along with the industry, they'll review, they'll discuss, and they'll look forward. But of course, If the commercial insurers come back to the market next spring and there's a solution in the market which we can all use, then the government fund will be needed. There's a fantastic piece by Jake Cantor in Deadline. He talked about, you know, the scheme needing to be agreed by the end of July. How critical was it to get this over the line before the end of July? Well, it was very critical because we're not like a factory where you can just switch the power off and then two weeks later you can go back in and switch the power back on and all the machines or all the workers will start producing whatever goods. We we have to assemble cast and crew and facilities and locations and production teams and you know a whole range of things. So you actually need a bit of lead time to do that. Of course, really, really big shows need a long lead time and they, they may not be ready till next spring, but hopefully they can get the benefit of this fund then given what I said earlier. So it was really important. We wanted everyone to know there was something coming that they could use that would be backdated to the end of July so you can confidently start planning uh, getting back into principal photography and getting back into production. We all want to get money going back through the companies. We all want to get freelancers on furlough. We all want to, and and God knows, you know, it's been a very lean summer for everyone uh, and a very lean summer for British schedules as well. So we all need to get new programming made for British audiences. The schedules are already looking a bit threadbare, (laughs) to say the least. It would be a bad outcome if the result of COVID was to diminish the competitiveness of the British production industry, but also the competitiveness of British broadcasters who are facing even more competition. We were all very aligned to try and get as much up and running again this year, because if we didn't know by end of July and it stretched into August or or September, a lot of shows would have gone offshore, been cancelled or delayed until way into next year. 
and that would be bad news for everyone. Producers, freelancers, post-production, broadcasters, audiences, that would have been bad news. And we had made that very clear to government earlier on, and we had to work very hard with them to get to the announcement last Wednesday, which I'm delighted they did. Uh, They've at least said, we're going to have a fund, we're working on the details, there's more details to come. This is how it works so far. You know, so you can claim for suspension costs, you can claim for abandonment. We know what the, the caps are going to be on those, which is 5 million or the least. So the most you can claim is 5 million or 20% of eligible costs. So that's enough to give everyone clarity as more details will come out in terms of eligibility, who do you apply to. Government has yet to appoint someone to administer this. Mm. Um, I think it'd be very sensible if they appointed an insurance company or an insurance broker because they'll have to do loss adjusting and they'll need people who understand our business because government doesn't, believe you me, it took many weeks to explain to them (laughs) why this was a really important issue for us and uh, a lot of very heavy lifting politically to get them to listen and engage on that. They'll need to put that out to tender or appoint someone to administer it and then the details will come out. But the great news is for anyone going into principal photography now is you can back claim to the fund if you needed to. The worst thing for any type of business is uncertainty. You know, if you're a mega media platform, like a big streamer, right? I mean, your insurance cover is so massive and your premiums are so huge, you can probably say, well, we'll just self-insure, we'll just do it. If you're a small indie in Manchester, where for the past six months, you've not really been earning much money, you've been burning through your reserves, The idea that you could take a risk to cover potential COVID costs, which could range from £20,000 to several hundred thousand pounds, could be a company-defining moment, something went wrong. And that's why it was really important. It's not just about the big shows. It's not just to cover the big high-end TV drama. Production insurance is used by everyone, whether it's a small factual show that's been made in Manchester or a big drama being made in Manchester. Yeah. You need to have that confidence. And also your cast will want to know that. Your crew will want to know that. So it's about resetting us back as far as we can into a sort of normal working uh, cycle of production and delivery and commissioning. I also read that there was a, a, an issue with Brussels. So it was a state aid type issue that it, it needed to be approved by the European Union. Do you think that was a significant delay? Well, any intervention in the market normally has to be notified to Brussels because it's state aid. We're still part of the EU and uh, we're required to notify public money going into market because of the competition issues around that. Now, the French have taken a very different approach. Their level of support is capped. It's very specific to film and high-end TV drama. It's set at 50 million. They're looking at another scheme, which is a sort of commercial reinsurance scheme with the CNC. But again, that's capped at 50 million. The British scheme is to cover all British production, which is 500 million. Clearly, Brussels will have a little bit of a longer look at that. You know, the government has absolutely stood, you know, shoulder to shoulder with us on getting something of scale because, you know, we produce a lot more programming across a wider range. You know, many of my members, PACT members, are factual producers. They have to get insurance as well. And also, you've got to bear in mind that the UK audiovisual economy is a £12 billion economy. It's yeah. way bigger than France. So if we were, say, £50 million, it would barely touch the sides. And we modelled for government, if we were looking at normal production pre-COVID, you know, in any one month just to suspend production would cost at least quarter of a billion pound in payouts. But if you had to do full abandonment in any one month, it was close to a billion. We are a much, much bigger economy. That was also why it was hard to model this and convince government that we needed such a large amount of money basically to be put aside for potential claims. Because yeah. if 60% of the industry had to suspend at any given time, you have to have enough money sitting there to cover that. And 500 million is a very good number. John, thank you again for joining us. Fantastic news. And we'll be catching up with Danny Fenton as well and no doubt hearing some other UK producers in terms of what this means for them on a practical basis. So congratulations again. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. So my second guest on this week's telecast is Danny Fenton, CEO of leading UK independent production company, ZigZag Productions. Now, full disclosure, I handle PR for ZigZag, but this is not a pre-scripted chat. Danny didn't know what I was going to ask. 
One of the content industry's best-known factual producers, ZigZag, has produced over 750 hours of original programming for over 50 broadcasters worldwide since its inception. And those are across multiple genres, including factual, observational documentaries, factual entertainment, entertainment, game shows, cookery, sports, and news reactive programming. Recent ZigZag productions include Blink for Channel 4 and Fuse Media in the US, Ultimate Brain for CBBC, Japan Demonium for ITV, Troy the Magician for Facebook Watch, and the next Jamie Vardy for Sky One. So, welcome to the show, Danny. Hi, Justin. Good to be here. We announced last week your new reality competition series for BT Sport and Insight TV, Ultimate Goal. Tell us a bit about that. I'm a big football fan, so it's a, it's a labour of love whenever we do anything related to football. A couple of years ago, we did the next Jamie Vardy for Sky, which was England international Jamie Vardy looking for players who were amateurs who could become professionals like he did. So he went from working in a factory to winning the English Premier League in the space of five years. When we were making that show, we started to notice, you know, the rise of the of the, of the female game. And in truth, in the men's game, it's very difficult to go from amateur to professional like Jamie did. Quite, quite a rare uh, occasion that he did that. And the women's games in, in the UK has turned professional just in the last couple of years, but you know, around the world, it's become a, a real career for for women. And so we thought, well, what a great opportunity you know, to create a show where we could give women the opportunity to go from being amateurs to earning a professional living in the game. And we managed to bring together two broadcasters, um, BT Sport in the UK, who um, who show the women's professional league in the UK, and then um, Inside TV, who are a, a UHD 4K channel based in Holland, but in, in various territories, and have already been experimenting in football in different ways, but really love the idea of um, finding the next female star. And so hence, uh, Ultimate Goal was born. We heard from... John McVeigh earlier on about the new insurance fund that Pact has helped spearhead and, and implement. How do you think that that is going to affect ZigZag going forward? I think the you know the impact for ZigZag and I should imagine you know nearly all production companies in the UK of the insurance support from the government is that it will give people the confidence to go out and film. Because I think up until now, the risk has been on the producers and no producer, certainly no independent producer, is prepared to take that risk of there being a second wave while they're in production and having to carry the costs of that pause or that cancellation. So I know it's something, I mean, I'm I'm on the board of PACT as well, so I wear two hats. I know it's something that PACT and and John in particular have been lobbying government for, for for several months. In France, they brought it in, you know, uh, uh, earlier and it enabled them to go into production sooner. But it really is it's an essential piece of legislation for, you know, for the livelihood of, of people in the film and, and television sector. With regards to Ultimate Goal, the, the, the show that we just talked about that we're doing for BT, that actually got commissioned and went into pre-production before COVID and then got put on pause like a number of our productions were, that is actually covered under COVID because we had pandemic cover within the insurance for that. So it's it's really actually for new productions or new commissions that wouldn't be able to get that cover. So the, gov- the government fund or the government cover of the fund um, is essential for, for all major productions. The insurance that you had for... Ultimate Goal, which you started a little while ago and then paused. So you did have pandemic insurance. So actually, there's there's been a little bit of, I suppose, speculation as to, you know, how insurance companies are going to try and wriggle out of these sort of clauses. But you were covered. From now on, it's new productions that that you think it's really going to become come into its own. Really, yeah. I mean, we you know we had cover and we had a, you know, annual cover across productions that was would was covered for force majeure, which includes pandemics. The, the, the problem, as you rightly stated, 
is that for anybody who's now trying to take out insurance on a production, an insurance company wasn't prepared to give pandemic or COVID cover. It needed PACT you know, and the government to intervene to give that safety net to allow people to go into production knowing that if there was a claim necessary that the government would cover it. If we're talking about broadcasters and distributors, to a certain extent, they've been insulated certainly in, in, in the initial stages anyway, I think from a business perspective, whereas producers have had literally, as you said earlier on, had to pause or put on ice, or in some cases, I've heard that the productions have been outright cancelled. How has the pandemic affected ZigZag? I'd be lying if I said it hadn't been very challenging. Um, at the same time, I appreciate the fact that we're, we are in an industry where we can do something you know, unlike hospitality or travel or retail or so many other industries which are suffering terribly and also unable to do very much about it, we have managed to sort of continue throughout the pandemic. We, we've had to furlough people, as as have, you know, many other production companies. We've had to work from home. I say work from home. Somebody said to me the other day, which really stuck in my mind, we're not working from home. We're at home trying to work <laughs> during a global <laughs> pandemic. Which is quite different, you know. Is that we didn't isn't self elective that we said, oh, let's let's we'll go and we'll work from home during you know during the, this period. I'm pleased to say, as I speak to you now, I'm back in the office, and there are people back in the office, which is a really positive sign. During the pandemic period, Zigzag has been fortunate in that we are an independent company that's been around for a number of years. We have a big back catalogue. And we've been able to exploit that back catalogue in terms of selling some of our finished shows or reversioning some of our back catalogue or updating shows. And that, you know, I think has been a real saving grace for us. Uh, at the same time, we actually managed to sell um, some new shows. We, we're doing a new archive-based show for Sky that hasn't been announced yet, but it felt really good to be able to you know, get something new commissioned during this pandemic period because I think for a lot of producers... You know, they gave up hope that they could even get anything new away. In short, what I'd say, Justin, is, you know, we're surviving. I, I don't like to say we're thriving because I think that's, you know, that's not, it's not true. I find it generally quite unhelpful. And, you know, on a number of podcasts I've listened to, people talk about how great it is and how much they're loving, you know, lockdown and, you know, how their businesses aren't suffering. I, I find that hard to believe. I think that there's, there's an element for me that, you know, it's great to be positive, and I'm a positive person, but offering people false hope at a time like this is, I think, is wrong. You know, the freelance market has been devastated, and, you know, and we, we, we've tried to do all we can for the freelancers who are working for us, and you know, actually on a couple of the projects that have been paused between ourselves and the, and the broadcasters or, the, or the, the platforms we were working with, we continue to pay the freelancers beyond the period of the programme being put on pause. But the truth of the matter is, you know, this is unprecedented period we're, we're, we're living through. It's a very difficult and challenging period. People saying that they're having a great time or that business is great are, are, are slightly delusional because even for distributors who say, yes, you know, we're having a great time, we're selling all our, our catalogue, they've also got to recognise that there are very few shows being produced at the moment. There's going to be very little new programming coming out before 2021. And even, even the distributors are going to find programming thin on the ground. So I think I think we have to be realistic. We have to be pragmatic. Uh, we, we can be optimistic, but I don't think we should offer false hope to people where it doesn't exist. Zigzag is a business and you, as a CEO, you, you're very well known for traveling the world, searching out deals, searching out new partners, searching out... Um, Pants in places like South Korea, Brazil, all around the world, actually, and probably best known as, as you know, one of the one of the pioneers of that, really. In terms of there's been no physical opportunities for you to meet with people in person and network and really explore those serendipitous occasions that can turn into commissions for a producer. I mean, how have you found that? How have you found not being able to travel to these physical markets? I love visiting the markets. I love the, the TV global community. And, and, and as you say, I've traveled a lot over the years and I've, I've made some really good friends in 
in lots of territories. It's frustrating to not be able to to visit the markets. But what I've seen, sort of the flip side of that, is in many ways people are more readily available on video calls than they've ever been before. You know, a lot of commissioners, both both in the UK, in the US, where we do you know 50 percent of our business, and all, all around the world, people are making themselves more more readily available. And and you know, without the travel, people actually have sort of time in their in their calendar in their day. And I found people have been really generous with it, with their time. If, if anything, I'd say I would say I've been able to access decision makers and high level decision makers easier in lockdown than probably you know in, in the normal world where you know we're all working at 100 miles an hour and, and rushing around. Um, you know, what one thing I suppose lockdown has taught me is that you can pitch and you can be effective without getting on a plane. You know, and that's obviously good for global warming. Um, it's good for probably our, our, you know, sanity and our our health because you know, traveling around a lot, different time zones, and, and all of the things that travel brings in a positive. It, there are also negatives, you know, in terms of being away from family and, and all of those things. So, I think the world has been changed, and I think the change is going to be long lasting. And I don't know the next time we'll be able to go to a physical market. I really want to go, and the next time there is one, I mean, I'm hoping you know by January you know, for for NatP in Miami or Real Screen in New Orleans that we'll be able to go. But if not, you know, we'll, we'll have to make do with whatever alternatives there are. I mean, I have to say one thing I've kind of reached saturation point on is webinar conferences. You know, I think at the beginning of lockdown, I was lapping them up. Now, I think, you know, telecast, plug, plug is the only thing that I uh, religiously listen to. But I, I've become a, a bit exhausted by a, a lot of the others. And I, and I do feel like unless I can either be there in person or have a direct dialogue with somebody over a video call, I'm not, I'm not finding um, the, the webinars particularly satisfactory. Yeah. We've seen lots and lots of those webinars. And as you say, I think the sitting in front of your laptop for sort of three, four hours watching webinars, and particularly when they're panels, and particularly when they're panels with executives essentially being most of it being corporate spin and not you're not getting any insight out, out of it, that your your patience with them does wear thin quite quickly. Your conversations with distributors and networks. How have you found those have changed over the last six months? As I said before, distributors, I'm sure I have had a bit of a purple patch in terms of filling gaps in people's schedules. But I think also distributors are already realising there's a dearth of new material. So I think if you have content and we're fortunate in that, you know, we've got some, some shows that have already been shot, then distributors are incredibly hungry for that, you know, we've got a very good relationship with with Nent, and, and 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 we've been developing stuff for them, and they've been very supportive across the board. Distributors are are definitely hungry for what's available. As far as broadcasters are concerned, bit of a mixed bag, I'd say. In terms of commercial broadcasters, obviously they've been massively impacted by the you know, the, the fall off a cliff, shall I say. Of advertising revenue, um, it's been you know much publicised in, in the UK with Channel Four, um, ITV, and Channel Five. You know some of the digital channels, or the, as we would call them, sort of the cable and satellite channels, like Sky, have actually been probably a little better off because you know their model isn't purely based on advertising; it's subscription based as well. And Sky have launched a number of new channels during the uh, during the lockdown. And, and there's a hunger on those channels for new content. So I would say, you know, a, a sort of positive from their side. And then the streamers have, have obviously capitalised a lot on the lockdown with, with new subscribers and, you know, with money to spend. So it's not, you know, it's not a simple picture in terms of saying all, bro- all broadcasters are you know, in, one, in one situation. It's quite a mixed situation and then i would say in the us what's been interesting is uh, in many ways us has been 
you know, worsely affected than um, nearly every, every other country. And they seem to have a big appetite for finished programming or nearly finished programming or programming that needs finishing funds. So we've actually found the US to be quite a good area for conversation at this time. Looking forward, how do you see COVID affecting producers? We talked about, you know, the impact on distributors and we've talked about networks and platforms. What about producers in the short to medium term? The bigger you are, the harder you fall in a time like this. You know, I would consider us to be a you know medium sized company. I think the smaller medium sized companies, the, the, the so called SMEs, actually have a bit more flexibility and fleet of foot in this situation where they can they can downsize easier and they can cut their overheads a little bit easier. I wonder how the so called super indies are going to cope during this period. I wonder how the Bindamal, the Banjay Endemol uh, merger will play out. I mean, we're already seeing, obviously, there's people being let go from that merger, which, you know, was probably inevitable anyway. But I think, you know, the overheads mm. of those big companies will be substantial. And if there isn't the three throughput of content, they have to take much more drastic actions than, than probably a smaller company does. So... Um, I'm always a great believer in, 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 you know, in meritocracy, and I'm always a great champion of, of, of the little guy. And, I, and, I, and so I think, although there are going to be big challenges ahead, I think actually, if you're if you're small and you're nimble, and you can keep your costs down, maybe you don't even need an office. Maybe you can continue to work from home. Um, maybe you don't need a full time staff. Maybe you can ramp up and ramp down as and when you have production. That actually might um, might place you in a better position than you know uh, a big company that's got very big overheads and is, is going to struggle to to cover those costs in in, in what is going to be a very challenging period. So it's that time in the show where we get to hear who your hero of the week is and who or what you're going to be chucking in the bin. Danny, I've been looking forward to this. Give us your hero of the week. Well, my hero of the week. And this sounds quite sycophantic, but um, it's actually John McVeigh from Pact. And as I say, you know, I am a board member of Pact, so I have to, you know, swear my allegiances. But, you know, what John has done in terms of the insurance battle that he's won with the government, but his constant championing of the of the producer's cause is something that I think is, is globally recognised. He does seem to have a uh, unexhaustible energy. For, for going into bat for producers at a time really when an organization like pact has been most needed so fantastic so yeah absolutely hero of the week john mcveigh who are you going to be chucking in the bin it's funny justin you know i listen to telecast every week and i think people get very political and they get very serious on this and um i've also gone political and serious so um, right. Okay. You know, the person that I want to put in the bin is, is Wiley, the rapper, who is a British rapper who made um, anti-Semitic comments on Twitter, um, and then, rather than sort of apologising, continued to make further anti-Semitic comments, and then was taken down by Twitter. And you know, as somebody of the Jewish faith, I do feel that anti-Semitism in the media and in television is an issue. And I think, you know, people like Nick Cannon in America have recently been found to have made anti-Semitic comments. We had Reggie Yates in the UK, um, Tyson Fury, the world champion boxer, also, you know, publicly made anti-Semitic comments. And, you know, from my point of view, you know, Black Lives Matter campaign is really important, but I think all forms of racism, you know, however they're expressed, are wrong and they should be stamped out. You know, as I say, I think that as a Jewish person, I find the rise of anti-Semitism and the rise of anti-Semitism publicly stated by um, celebrity figures is, 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 is really concerning. And if I, if I may, um, Justin, and this is, I'm slightly cheating your system here. Right. I'd actually, I'd actually like to nominate a hero off the back of the villain, and, and that's a lady called Talia Levine at Broadcast Magazine. Yeah. And she's come out, uh, and I think very emotionally, but very um, 
effectively spoken out about anti-Semitism in the media. And I, I've noticed online there's been a lot of support for what she said. So um, I, I'd really like to support her because I don't think enough people come out and speak out against anti-Semitism. Quite right. And yeah, absolutely. Well done, Talia. And that anti-Semitism doesn't seem to have been called out with the same sort of force when we see these you know these these terrible you know quotes on twitter or or social media obviously black lives matter has been a very very needed and timely and powerful movement over the last few weeks and we've seen tv companies you know uh, adopting this very strongly and that's that's brilliant and so they absolutely should but i think anti-semitism doesn't necessarily get called out in the tv industry in quite the same way um there's a really great um drama that's currently uh, on air on Sky in the UK, but uh, I'm sure it's available in other countries as well, called The Plot Against America. And I recommend it because it actually looks at America uh, as if the Nazis had sort of taken control. And it looks at um, how the Jews were treated in that eventuality, but also all minorities. And I, th- I think it's it's a very timely reminder of the fact that we need to stand up for all minorities and that yeah uh, racism of any kind is unacceptable yeah quite right absolutely danny thank you so much for joining us this week really enjoyed having you on really honest and uh, great to have your insight well thanks thanks for the opportunity and uh, yeah it, having been a listener it's uh, it's a great privilege to uh, be invited on So it's that time in the show where we get to go over to Riga once again to speak to Gertz Lises from K7 Media. Hello, how are you doing? Hello, hello, Justin. I'm very well, thank you. Trying to balance work with enjoying summer. How about you? You know, we're enjoying lots of sunshine in London, which is rather unusual, but there's nothing usual about uh, about this year, is there really? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Very true. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This is definitely quite a different summer. What we are seeing in the recent weeks a lot, particularly in relatively safer countries, is news like the show, which uh, was originally set to launch in spring and was partly completed before the pandemic, led to a shutdown of production, is back in production again, or news like the show's returning to air after being interrupted early in the year. And then there are countries which uh, are working with determination towards attracting uh, production business from other parts of the world, like Australia, for instance, where the government has announced a $400 million fund for foreign producers, predicting that this fund will bring around $3 billion in foreign expenditure to the country and provide up to 8,000 jobs annually. Or New Zealand, which is also pitching itself uh, as an attractive location for international producers, announcing $230 million fund for both international and domestic productions. And then let's not also forget the announcements uh, in UK last month uh, about development of two major new studio facilities, including a, a new six soundstage studio complex in East London and a 12 soundstage Comcast Skybacked studio in Elstree, joining the existing Elstree studios and BBC Elstree complex and joining you too, Justin, I guess. That's right. Yeah, we're going to have new neighbours. Uh, the, uh, the the new complex is, uh, is just five minutes walk up the road, so it's going to be exciting to see that take shape. Fantastic, hopefully soon. And then uh, the Banijay and the Malshine merger deal was also greenlit by regulators in July. And what is quite interesting, looks like the appetite of now already the biggest indie production and distribution group is not going to be satisfied that easily as reportedly they are also currently in talks to buy Australia's seven studios, the home of the long-running Aussie soap opera Home and Away, which is likely to become of particular value in any potential deal having sold to over 80 countries and earning seven, roughly $30 million a year. Well, the, there is a reason why they say crisis is also the time for opportunities, right? Well, that's for sure. And it's important to keep one's eyes and, and ears open to spot the opportunities or even to create them and to be just flexible. And when it comes to 
existing formats, flexibility is also key and not just because of COVID. So I think it's always interesting to hear about new twists applied to well-known shows. So for instance, The Bachelor at Australia will return to Network 10 later this year featuring two sisters looking for love. Also, the OC version of Family Feud is currently in production as a 10 app special primetime television event celebrating the nation's emergency and healthcare workers, giving them the opportunity to win a hundred thousand dollar cash price. And in Sweden, the shooting of Survivor has begun in the very northern archipelago on the Swedish east coast instead of a tropic island. Obviously, the production is following severe safety protocols, including pre quarantining all uh, participants and only one person from the crew per day is allowed to travel to the nearest village if any supplies are needed. Then another trend we are noticing is that uh, broadcasters are increasingly bringing back formats that have been successful some time ago, since it obviously fits well into the broader behavior of playing safe during uncertain times. Like The Apprentice, Family Feud and Fem Farmer Wants a Wife are all returning in Australia after a break. Who Wants to Be a Millionaire is on air again in Israel. Dutch are bringing back The Big Brother after a 14-year break and this list could go on and on. But saying that there is certainly also quite a lot of new activity, both in unscripted as well as scripted space going on. For instance, in unscripted, there seems to be a trend of telling if someone is singing well without actually hearing the voice. TF1 in France has successfully premiered the local version of Global Agencies, Is That Really Your Voice?, in which singers attempt to impress a panel of celebrity judges who try to decide whether contestants are good singers before they have actually sung a note. By the way, this format has also found itself at the center of a copyhead dispute with the Korean distributors of a similar entertainment show, I Can See Your Voice, which has been already commissioned in major markets, including Germany, the Netherlands and the UK. Yeah, I, th I thought it sounded familiar. And on the same note, in Germany, ProSieben is working on a new talent competition format, which will be led by the former Eurovision winner Tom Neuwirth, best known by his stage name Conchita Wurst, in which contestants are going to perform on stage in a soundproof dome, while judges will try to decide whether these performers are singing well. And Netflix has also entered the singing competition space, as some may have noticed, with a karaoke show, Sing On, which launched in Spain recently and is also going to launch in Germany this week. Each episode of this show sees six competitors perform five well-known songs, karaoke style, but the quality of performances in this case is determined by a computer voice analysis system. Another interesting premiere in Germany is planned on Z1 next week on 16th of August, a weekly Sunday early primetime show called Mein Hund, die Kilos und ich, My Dog, the Kilos and Me. I'm sure you will like it, Justin. What's that, the My Dog? The, the kilos, kilos and Me, yes. And Me, okay. Yeah, and it will feature dogs and their dog owners who share a weight problem with their pets and will participate in this new duo dieting format helped by a dog trainer and a fitness trainer they are going to try to lose the most combined weight uh, with a winning pair receiving a trip to a wellness hotel a money prize and a coveted golden bone <laughs> that's brilliant <laughs> a golden bone exactly but perhaps uh, yeah the, an easier way to lose weight is just to play a tag, you know, at least in Australia, where Seven Network is preparing the local adaptation of the US format Ultimate Tag, which made its debut on Fox in May, for which it proved to be a hit. Like the title suggests, this show has contestants compete in a high energy version of the classic playground game as they try to dodge and tumble and dive their way through three dimensional courses while avoiding being caught by the resident taggers. Good. So you tried to say something. I mean, I know I've put on a few pounds during lockdown, but no, no, no. I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, all right. I'm, I always think that these uh, kind of fun ideas is something you value. It is. So it is. That's, that's why I pointed out. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'm going to look out for my dog, the kilos, and me. That's that sounds a brilliant, 
brilliant format. <laughs> so it's not only unscripted. We've talked about uh, unscripted and scripted before, but scripted side of the business is growing as well, right? Indeed, yeah. There are also quite a few notable scripted projects around which are in one or another way related to this COVID situation. I think that Belgians have found quite an interesting approach to film a series where a premise itself perfectly provides an ideal corona-proof set. VRT is a prepping anthology drama miniseries called Lockdown, with each of the 12 episodes telling a short 10-minute independent story based around two characters, all set in the visiting room of a prison, with visitors obviously communicating between a glass separation. On top of that, the cast will be changing in each episode, featuring various uh, prisoners and visitors, and each episode will be shot in one day, with crews changing as well. And in such way, removing any further risks that might be caused by someone getting infected or if the production would need to shut down midway. Another interesting project is gearing up for production in Germany. And what's unusual about it is that it's going to be based on an actual true events that happened just a few weeks ago. The four-part miniseries titled Their Jungle, The Jungle, will be following the real-life outbreak of coronavirus at a meat factory in Germany. Uh, The drama will tell the disaster through the eyes of three families, one uh, which fears losing power, another suffers from the outbreak, and the third one tries to discover the truth. And this is quite uncharacteristic, as you may remember us talking about this before, that it's uh, not too typical to reflect on current or very recent crisis situations in a form of fiction, but of course there is also a British example of ITV drama around Boris Johnson and his uh, actions on coronavirus, as we as we mm-hmm. all know. So yeah, this this situation is quite untypical, I think. And then the third series um, I wanted to mention is a an apocalyptic comedy series, Bari Barista and Het Einde de Tilden, if I pronounced it well, because it's in Dutch, it's called in English Bari Barista and the End of the Times, which launched on Videoland in the Netherlands a couple of weeks ago, and is telling a story about a barista who tries to keep his coffee shop open throughout uh, an apocalypse, convinced that a good cup of coffee uh, can improve any situation. However, his customers, surprise, surprise, seem to have uh, other priorities during a catastrophic event. This series is shot using virtual production technology, a 16 to 5 meter LED screen with a dynamic background was used on the film set. And this meant that the burning, chaotic environment could be created in real time. This is the first time such technology has been uh, used on this scale in the Netherlands, as that's something which has been used for some time in international productions, but is considered groundbreaking for the local film and TV industry. So once again, we see how quickly the TV industry is adapting to those uh, current restrictions. And and I guess sooner or later, somebody is going to get, unfortunately, going to get ill during production with all these productions reopening. And, and But perhaps that might not be the end of the world type situation, right? Absolutely. And it's already happening, Justin. I think that the Australian production of Dancing with the Stars was a great example of turning a defect into an effect, so to speak. The series were close to the end at the time COVID broke out when uh, the father of one of the participating celebrities tested positive. Obviously, this celebrity and its pro partner had to self-isolate for two weeks at their hotel as precaution. And this meant they had to self-shoot all the training on their iPhones and send it through to the production. And they were also required to do their own hair and makeup for the show. The costumes were left at the concierge for them to pick up and get ready themselves. And then, whilst they were in the hotel room, the crew went in and rigged the rooftop with remote cameras and they danced on the rooftop of the hotel, just two of them. So making it some pretty magical, compelling viewing. Are we seeing more authentic programming, both in scripted and unscripted, coming through as a trend, do you think? Absolutely. Hyper-authenticity. Gertz, as ever, thank you very much. Enjoy the summer. Enjoy the sunshine. Speak to you soon. Take care. Speak soon. Bye. Well, we've reached the end of another week's show. Thanks as always for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Please do rate and subscribe to the show and share it with friends and colleagues on social media. If you're a UK indie and you want further detail on the Emergency COVID Insurance Fund, 
please visit the PACT website at pact.co.uk and there's a link in the episode description. If you want to hear about our advertising and sponsorship packages, please email me on justin at boomdialogue.com. That's justin at boomdialogue.com. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers. We'll see you again next week. Till then, stay safe.